billions of fans, multi-million dollar player salaries, huge stadiums and a passion bordering on fanaticism. We are of course talking about football, the most popular sports game in the world. Why was football once banned? How did English schoolboys hook the whole world onto their game? And why did football become a new religion in South America, but remained relatively unpopular in North America until the 21st century? Let's try to figure all of this out in this episode of How It Was. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel, ring the notification bell, and give this video a thumbs up if you enjoy our content. So how and when did football begin? Its official place and date of birth is considered to be England in the 19th century. In medieval Britain, there was already a ball game called football, yet it was more like a mass brawl than a modern celebration of tactical sports and skill. These early football games were rarely ever held, but whenever they were hosted, it was on a grand scale. More often than not, entire villages played against other villages, and the number of players was not limited. Instead of a field, there was just a space between villages, sometimes several kilometers long. Games could last for several days, and the goal was to get the ball into the opponent's goal by any means necessary. The only illegal technique was to kill your opponents. Hence injuries were common. Moreover, matches sometimes escalated into riots. There were more than 30 attempts to ban football in England over the course of three centuries, but without much success. From rural fields and city squares, this ball game migrated to educational institutions. By the middle of the 19th century, football became the primary mode of recreation for students of elite schools, then the Golden Youth of England. By that time, the game was also known on the other side of the Atlantic, in colleges within the United States and Canada. Football rules were gradually implemented in these English schools. Since they were private, and the rules were only ever passed down orally, from older students to younger ones, it turned out that almost every school had its own football. Because of this, it was almost impossible to play against a neighbouring school, for example, and recruits in the army or classmates in college found that they played football in sometimes very different ways. This prompted graduates from several schools to get together and finally agree on universal football rules. These were approved on October the 26th, 1863, at the Freemasons Tavern in London. Representatives of Rugby School, by the way, took part in the first few meetings, but they could not come to terms with such blasphemy as the prohibition to carry the ball in their hands. They left, therefore, to establish their own kind of football, with an oval ball and tackles. That game, as you know, was named after the school where it originated, Rugby. The emergence of a single set of rules made the game quite popular. The new football quickly attracted interests from all walks of life. By 1883, the Blackburn Olympic Club, which was created by labourers, won the Football Association Challenge, or FA, Cup. But while football spread throughout the British Isles, Britain spread its influence around the world. This was not only done for the conquest of new colonies, but also to secure trade relations. The British went anywhere as long as their pound was accepted, and so in the 1880s, about 20% of Britain's foreign investments went to South America. By 1890, Buenos Aires was home to approximately 45,000 Britons. These guests introduced the locals to British entertainment, including football, a simple and democratic game for which a ball and two pairs of stones to mark out the goalposts were enough. The main countries to accept football in Latin America were Argentina, Uruguay and Brazil. This was largely due to the outstanding popularizers of the game. In Brazil, Charles Miller was one such football prophet. He was born in São Paulo as the son of a Scottish railway engineer and an English Brazilian woman. When Charlie was 10, his parents sent him off to study in Britain. He eventually returned as an adult bringing with him a couple of playing balls and a desire to develop football in his homeland. Four years later, Miller founded the San Paolo Football Club and later participated in the creation of the championship for the state of San Paolo. Like his father, Miller worked for a railway company. This made it possible for him to travel between different parts of the country and promote football. Miller later became one of the leaders of the local branch of the Royal Mail and in 1904, he was also honoured as a Vice Consul of Britain. 
Miller unfortunately died in 1953, just five years before Brazil's first World Cup victory. But over the course of his lifetime, he managed to see how a passion for football invigorated his homeland. Argentina also has its own founding father of football, school teacher Alexander Hutton. He arrived in the New World from Scotland and took a job at St Andrews School. Although by that time Argentinians had known about football, it had not yet become the main game. Hutton even once asked for local school board to increase the number of playing fields for the students, but he was outright refused. Then in 1884, Hutton founded his very own school and went on to have a hand in the creation of the Argentine Football Association, the first such organization on the continent to host national championships. Hutton's son did not go on to shame his father either. He became the top scorer of the 1913 championship. Before his death, Hutton even got the chance to see how Argentina won the silver medal in the 1930 World Cup. In that match, Argentina lost to its neighbors from Uruguay. The father of Uruguayan football, the Englishman William Poole, also bore witness to this game. His biography is in many ways similar to Hutton's. Poole arrived in the Uruguayan capital Montevideo in 1885 to teach English. A year later, a student of Poole decided to create the country's first football club, named Albion. Initially, only British people were admitted into Albion, hence the name. But Poole objected, insisting that everyone had the right to play football. Poole himself, in addition to his primary occupation, found the time to play football, was a referee, and in 1901, he even became president of the newly created Uruguay Football Association. It was under his leadership that the Uruguayan team was able to win the 1930 World Cup, as well as the two previous Olympics in 1924 and 1928. The efforts of this trinity of football profits soon began to bear fruit. The first America's Cup was held in 1916, while in Europe, it should be noted, such an event was only held 40 years later. By the 1920s, footballers in Latin America had become folk heroes, and football had become one of the few ways for children to socially lift themselves from poor families. This, by the way, was one of the reasons for the emergence of a special playing style in Latin America, where the emphasis was not on discipline and endurance, but on individual skill and beauty. Many of the stars-to-be learned to play in the cramped streets of a slum where good ball control was essential. Hence, all sorts of feints and tricks were implemented, sometimes even to the detriment of team play. Nevertheless, in the 1920s, teams from Latin America began to easily outmatch their European counterparts, who still relied on the conservative English style. These newer football tactics were also extremely entertaining to watch, so they attracted more and more fans to the sport. It seems that the question of how football became almost like a religion in Latin America has been dealt with. We urge you to write down the names of your favorite Latin American football players in the comments section below. But now let's move on. Why hasn't football become the number one game in North America? After all, Canada and the United States have inherited many more English cultural traditions than Argentina or Uruguay. As paradoxical as it may sound, one of the reasons may be that football came to North America earlier than it did to Latin America. As we mentioned earlier, colleges in Canada and the United States forged their football traditions long before players in England had agreed upon universal rules. When these rules appeared, American colleges took them as an inspiration rather than as scripture. By the 1880s, the rules of American football which Americans simply call football, to this day, had formed out of a mixture of English football, rugby, and local college football styles. At first glance, American football appears closer to rugby. The ball is oval, tackles are widespread, and playing with hands is allowed. But there are also important differences. For example, in rugby, it is forbidden to pass forwards or tackle a player who does not carry the ball. The English version of the game was nicknamed soccer in the United States and became popular mainly among European immigrants. Another reason for the low popularity of football in the States is that by the time it had appeared, there was already a number one national game, baseball. It became wildly popular in the mid-1850s. By the end of that decade, the United States already had a baseball association, several recognized teams, and a wide audience of dedicated fans. In Canada, the situation was similar. 
except that the number one game there was not destined to become baseball or American football, but ice hockey. Interestingly enough, football also did not become the main sports game in many other British colonies such as Australia, New Zealand and South Africa, all of which gave way to its closest relative, rugby. We cannot completely cross out North America from the football map, however. At the first World Cup in 1930, for example, the US team reached for semi-finals. There, however, Argentina defeated them with a score of 6-1. In addition, this tournament was held in Uruguay, which only 13 teams reached, and only four were from Europe. There were even two professional soccer leagues in the United States, although this was more of a problem than an advantage. For many years, they argued for the title of being the main league, which somewhat undermined the reputation of the sport. Once the leagues finally agreed to unite, the US stock market collapsed and the Great Depression began, so the country had no time for football anymore. The popularization of English football in the United States was attempted again only 30 years later. In 1968, the North American Football League was born, trying to unite the best clubs in the United States and Canada, but its broadcast ratings were deplorable. To salvage this situation, clubs began to invite superstars into their ranks, and so Pelé, Franz Beckenbauer, Johan Cruyff, George Best and other players who wanted to make money at the end of their careers ended up in the USA. But the surge in viewers' interest was short-lived, not least due to incompetent leadership. Only two teams applied for the 1985 championship, which resulted in the league's liquidation. However, in 1994, FIFA staged the World Cup in the USA, and it broke tournament records, with over 3.5 million fans attending, a record that still stands. The number of Hispanics and other diaspora in the United States was no doubt a factor, as was the explosion of women's soccer as a grassroots sport. USA won the inaugural FIFA Women's World Cup in China in 1991, since which time the team has won three more times and are current champions, as well as four times Olympic gold medalists. By the mid-2000s, soccer in the United States had begun to acquire a new home-based audience. The opportunity to watch the best moments of matches on YouTube and constant broadcasts of the world's top soccer games, such as the Champions League, via television, spurred public interest. David Beckham's decision to move to the United States in 2007 attracted even more attention to the sport across the entire country. New sponsors followed the audience, and their money allowed them to invite even more stars like Zlatan Ibrahimovic and Wayne Rooney. So it seems as though professional football, or soccer, is gaining momentum in North America. Who knows, maybe one day it will reach the same level of popularity as it did in South America, even perhaps surpassing more traditional American sports. Do you agree with this projection? Write your opinion in the comments section below and do not forget to give this video a like if you enjoyed it as well as subscribe to the channel, hit the notification bell and share this episode with your friends. See you soon.